This episode is brought to you by Blinkist. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and this is Mythology Explained. Today we're talking about who may just be the biggest douche in the world of mythology, me. Okay, who's been playing with my teleprompter? Gunther Bernard, was that you? Do I have to put you back in the dungeon? Ugh, sorry about that. I was going to say that Narcissus is the biggest douche in mythology, or at least that's how it seems at first glance. Pretty much everyone's heard the story about him seeing his reflection, falling in love with it, and being physically incapable of taking his eyes off it. But even if you don't know the myth, you've probably come across references and reimaginings of his character in other places, one of the most notable being in Disney's Hercules. Fabulous party, you know, I haven't seen this much love in a room since Narcissus discovered himself. <clears throat> Kinda weird that he's on Mount Olympus because he is definitely not a god, but that's besides the point. This kissy-faced monstrosity is a solid representation of how everyone thinks of Narcissus, and while it does make some sense, I'm going to go so far as to say it's a bit unfair. Because after reading the original myth, I realized that Narcissus was kind of screwed from the start, and that naming an entire personality disorder after him was a little dramatic. You'll see exactly what I mean as I break down and analyze not just the most famous version of the myth, but the many other tellings that came before and after after it. First though, I've got to pay some bills, so let me say thanks to this week's sponsor and one of my favorite new services that I found recently, Blinkist. So it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that I read a lot for this channel. Books for children, books for adults, old books and new books, red books and blue books. But as much as I love that reading fairy tales and ancient religious texts is part of my job, it can be mentally draining. So I don't always have the energy to read recreationally, even when I really want to, and there's books on my bookshelf that I know I would love. That's where today's sponsor, Blinkist, comes in. What they do is take all the highlights and important insights from nonfiction books and condense them into 15 minutes that you can either read or listen to. And let me tell you, this app has been a game changer since the moment I downloaded it. I've been able to read books like The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and Welcome to Management without detracting from the time I reserve for researching and writing. My new routine every morning as of late has been wake up, find a book I want to read on Blinkist, take Gunther for a walk, and by the time we get back, I'm almost done and have already learned something new before breakfast. Whether you're looking for self-improvement, professional development, parenting advice, or tips on how to invest, Blinkist is an amazing tool that can save you time, money, and energy. Even if they weren't a sponsor, I'd recommend the service to everyone, but what's cool is the first 100 people who go to my link in the description are going to get unlimited access for a week to try it out and 25% off the full membership. So go ahead and give it a shot. If you're someone who's always wanted to make a habit out of reading but just never had the time or energy, Blinkist really could be life changing changing. And we're back, so let's dive in, shall we? If you haven't already, be sure to hit that like button and help us reach our massive goal of 11 whole likes, subscribe for new content like this every week, and now, the messed up origins of Narcissus. So like always, there are several variants of the Narcissus myth, and each of them has a pretty unique twist on the story. That being said, there is a best known and what I'd consider definitive edition. It can be found in book three of Ovid's Metamorphoses, written around 8 AD. That's 8 AD, by the way, not 880. Just want to clarify. His version of the myth opens by introducing the reader to Tiresias, a seer who would one day be famous for his accuracy. He's got a whole crazy story of his own that we'll have to cover one day. Ovid says the first person to listen to one of his prophecies was a lovely nymph named Liriope, and she came to him with her 15-year-old son, Narcissus. He was an especially beautiful boy and the son of Sophisus, the river god. But that still doesn't justify him being on Olympus, Disney. You're telling me that Hercules had to earn his spot up there by literally sacrificing sacrificing his soul for Meg, but this guy gets to spend eternity fantasizing about his own reflection and no one has a problem with it? <sighs> Moving on. Liriope asked the seer if her son would live to be an old man one day as she and the father were concerned about the impact that his unparalleled beauty would have on his life. Tiresias responded that if he but failed to recognize himself, a long life he may live beneath the sun. Now that's obviously a pretty vague statement, so Liriope didn't take it too seriously, but it would go on to be proven true one day. Over the next several years, many beautiful men and women vied for Narcissus's attention, and wow is his name hard to say in the possessive sense. 
Despite having no shortage of options, the handsome lad turned down every offer on account of his pride and oversized ego. He simply never came across anyone worthy of being blessed with his love. That is, until a nymph named Echo altered the trajectory of his entire life. Some important context about Echo, she's actually the reason Zeus was able to get away with having so many affairs. Whenever the lightning god was out chasing tail, Echo would distract Hera with extremely long, pointless, uninteresting stories until he finished his business. Seriously. When Hera found out about this trickery, she cursed Echo to only be able to repeat the last few words of whatever someone said to her. And now her name makes sense, doesn't it? So one day Echo spotted Narcissus hunting in the woods with his friends and fell in love with him on the spot. But sadly, she can't tell him how she feels, so instead, she follows him for a while. At one point, he gets separated from his companions and calls out, who is here? To which Echo replies, here. Still unsure of where his stalker is, he calls again, come here. And she replies, come here. Narcissus says, avoid me not. And Echo says the same. And finally he yells, oh, let us come together. At that at that point, they meet in the middle and Echo gets a little carried away. She wraps her arms around him, to which he basically says, don't touch me like that. I'd rather die before someone like you would ever caress me. In a bit of gallows humor, Echo responds, caress me, but Narcissus was already walking away, completely content leaving her with a broken heart. And Echo, unable to endure the pains of rejection and loneliness any longer, let herself waste away. She didn't eat, she didn't drink, and eventually the only trace of her that remained were her bones and her voice that haunted the forest like a disembodied spirit. Meanwhile, Narcissus continued living his life in blissful ignorance, rejecting anyone who put themselves out there for him until the goddess Nemesis, who punishes anyone who's guilty of hubris, decided to give him a taste of his own medicine. Depending on the interpretation, she either saw what his rejection and callousness did to Echo, or one of the many spurned would-be lovers called to the goddess for help. Either way, she obliges. On a particularly hot summer day when Narcissus was exhausted from hunting, she put a beautiful, serene fountain in his path. And according to Ovid, when he leaned over to quench his thirst, another thirst increased. You see, while drinking, he caught a glimpse of himself reflected in the fountain water. And just like so many of his rejected suitors, he fell in love at first sight. Only this moment is not at all what Narcissus imagined it to be like couldn't hold, kiss, or even talk to this beautiful man. He cries out to the forest that he's in pain. Why must he have fallen in love with this image that he can't embrace? The only thing that stands in the way of them being together is a little water, yet he can't surmount this seemingly small obstacle. He says that he knows the stranger loves him back, for every time he leans in to kiss or hold him, his actions are reciprocated. And when he shows the pain of this struggle, the stranger does too. Unable to leave the allure of this image, he had no choice but to come to terms and accept that his love Love could never be reciprocated. And this moment is when the fire of the passion burning inside him consumed his physical form. In a matter of moments, his body melted away and the only thing that remained was a gold and white flower that would forever be known as the Narcissus. In that solo fam was not only the myth of Narcissus, but also the origins of the world's first thirst trap. What may be the saddest part of the story, though, is what happened after Narcissus died. The spirit of the dejected Echo was forced to watch as the man she loved was consumed with madness and literally burned alive. And when Narcissus uttered his last words, Oh marvelous boy, I loved you in vain, farewell, Echo repeated after him, farewell. So it seems like Gunther really wants to sit behind me for this section. Hopefully that's not too distracting for you. Just be good and we're fine. Deal? Good boy. So the version of the myth that we just went through was written by the Roman poet Ovid. However, there are several other variants that were written both before and after. The earliest rendition we found was written by a Greek poet named Parthenius around 50 BC, but it's almost definitely not the first rendition. And the reason I say that is because it reads like it's summarizing a longer work. In fact, because it's so short, we can actually go through the whole thing. He had a cruel heart and hated all of them, till he conceived a love for his own form. He wailed seeing his face, delightful as a dream within a spring. He wept for his beauty, 
Then the boy shed his blood and gave it to the earth to bear. See what I mean? Granted, this is only a fragment of the poem. The rest has been lost, but even that covers the entirety of the story. We're pretty much just missing who he refers to. Let me ask though, did you catch the difference in the ending? Instead of Ovid's very dramatic inner flame consuming Narcissus, there's an implied suicide with bloodshed. I'm thinking Narcissus stabbed himself in the stomach or heart, which would be pretty poetic. Now, another rendition by a mythographer named Conan is believed to have been written before Ovid's, though they did actually live around the same time. It also ends in suicide, but the events leading up to it are a bit different. For starters, instead of Narcissus being pursued by women, he's pined after by exclusively men. And there's one man in particular that sets the wheel of karma in motion. His name was Amenius, and for some reason, after Narcissus rejected him, he gave the poor guy a sword, a gesture that can only be interpreted in one of two ways. I may not desire your affection, but I respect you and the courage it took to reveal your true feelings toward me. Take this blade. It belonged to a comrade of mine who was slain by a wild boar on a recent hunting expedition. He was the bravest man I knew until now. Or, ha, you think I could possibly desire you, Amenius? That is quite hysterical. You are so ugly. In fact, take this blade. You can use it to kill yourself. Sadly, I couldn't find any context that made it clear which way he intended it, but apparently Amenius took it pretty poorly because he used the sword to commit suicide right on his doorstep. And while he was bleeding out, he prayed to the gods to give Narcissus a taste of his own medicine. But the end of the story goes exactly how you're used to. Narcissus walks by a pool of water, drinks some, becomes entranced by his own reflection, and kills himself because he can't fuck it. Now, a century after Ovid's time, a writer named Pausanias wrote a very unique variant of the story where Ovid Ovid falls in love with his twin sister rather than himself. Apparently, he thought the original version was ridiculous and wrote, it is utter stupidity to imagine a man that is old enough to fall in love was incapable of distinguishing a man from a man's reflection. To which I would respond, sure, but magic. His version is a lot more believable though. In it, Narcissus and his sister are nearly identical and the best of friends. Their hair was the same, they wore similar clothes, they hunted together, they were basically Mary-Kate and Ashley if Mary-Kate was secretly in love with Ashley. But one day while they were out hunting, the sister went and got herself killed. Then this absolutely wrecked Narcissus. Being that he lived in an era before cameras, the only thing he had to remember her beautiful face was his own face. So in a deranged form of therapy, he would go to a nearby spring every day just to stare at his own reflection because it reminded him of her. Eventually though, the pain was too much for him to bear and you can guess what happened next. So those are the many lives of Narcissus, each of them unique from the other. But interestingly, all of them end in the same way, suicide and the sprouting of the Narcissus flower from his blood. The really interesting thing about that too is that we can tell from the writings of other poets that the flower was named before the character. For example, long before the Narcissus story was written, Pamphos wrote that when Persephone was kidnapped by Hades, she was picking the Narcissus flower. Wait, does that mean this whole myth was really just an origin story for a flower? Well, no, that probably wasn't the sole purpose of it being written, but it does make for a nice tie-in. It's also worth mentioning that his mother Liriope and the rejected lover Amenius also have names that are very similar to the ancient Greek names for certain flowers and herbs. Who knows, maybe when they died, flowers sprouted from their corpses too. That'd be pretty romantic. Now, for those who aren't aware, while the flower may have come before the character, the character came before the disorder. We use Narcissus's name to describe someone who's egotistical and self-absorbed by calling them a narcissist or narcissistic. However, that didn't start until 1898 when narcissism was identified as a disorder by Havelock Ellis. Before that, the ancient Greeks used the term hubris to describe someone with a swollen sense of pride, and over time, other terms like self-love and egotism were thought up. But the question remains, was Narcissus actually a narcissist, strictly in the clinical sense of the word? Well, I'm no psychologist, but I do have access to Wikipedia, which means I'm qualified to be one. So let's take a look at what the disorder actually is. So it turns out there are four dimensions of narcissism, leadership authority, superiority, arrogance, self-absorption, admiration, and exploitativeness, entitlement. I know that sounds like eight dimensions, but a lot of those are synonyms. Now, I don't know about you, but I only saw Narcissus display two of those categories. He was very arrogant and self-absorbed for sure, but I'm hesitant to say leadership or entitlement. Granted, we didn't get to see what role he played with his hunting companions, but the fact that he got lost from them tells me that he wasn't the one in charge. As 
As for the entitlement aspect, you could argue that he acted entitled to someone better than his suitors, but that's not how I interpreted it. To me, it seemed like he wasn't romantically interested in anyone until a magic fountain convinced him that his reflection was a separate person. And while I understand that he doesn't have to embody all of the disorder's traits to be diagnosed with it, it's fucking named after him. Like if someone came up with a disorder based on my personality, but threw in symptoms that didn't apply to me, I'd be pissed. The patient exhibits persistent curiosity, immeasurable sarcasm, and an inability to stop procrastinating. Ah, yes, sounds like a classic case of soloism. He also eats cat hair. Oh, well, that sounds like something totally different then. Nah, it's soloism. I already wrote it down. How'd you say you got this job? My dad's your boss. Anyway, the point is that while Narcissus may be a pretentious douche, I think that naming an entire disorder after him was a little dramatic even if it is catchy. And he does technically exhibit traits of that disorder. Besides, if the guy wasn't so arrogant and didn't turn down all of his suitors, he still would have left a trail of broken hearts in his path. He'd either have eventually accepted someone's proposal and been forced to crush the dreams of everyone who hit on him after that, or he'd eventually cheat on a significant other, they would pray for revenge, and he would wind up being turned into a male version of Medusa. I'm just saying, the guy was doomed to be a Greek tragedy from the start, so let's cut him a little slack. And while you're at it, give Medusa some love too. I mean, not literally, that's how she got in the mess in the first place, but take the time to listen to her full story. You might be surprised at what you learn. As for this episode though, that was the messed up origin of Narcissus. If you don't know, now you know. And I genuinely am curious, what are your thoughts on the myth? Do you see the character differently now? And which version of his story is your favorite? Let me know in a comment down below. Then make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons because if you don't, the Persians win. For those who want to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news and what I'm up to between videos, I highly encourage you to follow me on social media. And for those who want to follow a boy so beautiful he makes Narcissus look like a freak show attraction, follow my pal Gunther. He could use the self-esteem boost anyway. He told me that his face is a little too smushy. Don't cry, it's okay. You're a cutie. I'll see you guys and gals next week with another new episode. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.